back in the Middle Ages, it was referred to as the problem of faith and reason. We know certain things by faith, we know certain things by reason. It sometimes, yet sometimes they seem to say slightly different things. And so the question is, how do we reconcile these two ways of knowing things? How do we reconcile faith and reason? The basic answer that was produced is, it could be diagrammed like this. Ultimately, God is the source of everything. He's the source of all truth, therefore. But God discloses truth to us in more than one way. Sometimes he discloses truth to us through direct divine revelation, like through Jesus and the prophets. And when that's the case, we need to take those truths on faith. On the other hand, he also has given us the gift of reason. And so consequently, we need also to use our reason to examine the world around us and therefore learn things about the world, to learn truths about the world that God has enabled us to know using his gift of reason. And so both faith and reason have a role to play in contributing to human knowledge. If you look in paragraph 337 of the Catechism, it says, God himself created the visible world in all its richness, diversity, and order. Scripture presents the work of the Creator symbolically as a succession of six days of divine work concluded by the rest of the seventh day. On the subject of creation, the sacred text teaches us the truths revealed by God for our salvation, permitting us to recognize the inner nature and value and ordering of the whole of creation to the praise of God. So that's what it says about scripture. What does it say about the relevant science? If you look in paragraph 283, it says, the question about the origins of the world and of man has been the object of many scientific studies which have splendidly enriched our knowledge of the age and dimensions of the cosmos, the development of life forms, and the appearance of man. These discoveries invite us to even greater admiration for the greatness of the Creator, prompting us to give Him thanks for all His works and for the understanding and wisdom He gives to scholars and researchers. A religious and theological importance, it doesn't contain significant elements from the point of view of the natural sciences. So don't look to Genesis 1 to teach you science. Look to Genesis 1 to teach you theology. And he comments on that too. He says, the Bible speaks to us of the origin of the universe and its makeup, not in order to provide us with a scientific treatise, but in order to state the correct relationship of humanity with God and the universe. Sacred Scripture simply wishes to declare that the world was created by God. Well, in recent times, the Magisterium has actually addressed these questions, and it's seen a significant role for symbolism in the early chapters of Genesis. Paul II, saying the woman was created from the man's rib, is a metaphorical and figurative way of saying that they're the same. This now is another human being. Being a creature, must freely recognize and respect with trust. Man is dependent on his creator and subject to the laws of creation and to the moral norms that govern the use of freedom. So if we look at what the Magisterium has said on these questions recently, it's seen a significant role for symbolism in these early passages in Genesis. All right, day two, we just heard Jimmy Aiken talk and his talk was so good. And now we're looking for Coffee. Uh, the father of the matriarch who was mentioned last night by uh, Stacy or Gregor Mendel. Uh, and there are many in the world today, you probably all know about the great father Tad Boholchik. And I, I think these are people who, by, their, by the witness of their lives and by their commitment to study, uh, they hold up a vision of human culture and society and what it is to be truly human that's very, very valuable. It's a, it's a particular thing, and it's a very important thing, and Father Ehrman lives it. He's the Assistant Director for Life Sciences Research and Outreach at the University of Notre Dame, a, uh, also a professional specialist in the Theology Department, teaching science, theology, and creation at Notre Dame. Please welcome Father Terrence Ehrman. Well, I'm going to talk about 
what's new about the new atheism and what's not. Richard Dawkins, who's probably the most famous new atheist in the planet today. John Zahn, a Holy Cross priest from the 19th century, early 20th century. And Hazel Motes, who's the main character from Flannery O'Connor's first novel, Wise Blood. Should science, should the practice of science, lead one to atheism or to God or something in between? So the New Atheist, for those who aren't familiar, they're called the Four Horsemen of the New Atheism. Richard Dawkins is probably the most famous biologist at uh, Oxford, used to be at Oxford. Sam Harris is still alive. Christopher Hitchens died in 2011. Dawkins is probably the most famous of those. Um, but they all have similar, something similar in common that, that science is incompatible with religion and with faith and with God, that science itself disproves God's existence. So I want to talk about that, these claims of conflict between science and faith. Students that I have in class, some of them will write in their papers. I was raised Catholic, but then when I got Darwin in high school, I became an atheist. And it always befuddles me why this is the case. And so these claims of conflict, what does one, and I ask my students this question, should science lead one to God or away from God? And it's particularly urgent today, right, as there's this wave of new atheists who are out promoting atheism. And the knowledge of theology. Right? There are all different kinds of knowledges. There are all different sciences in the literal meaning of the term scientia. And wisdom is the understanding of the cause of something. So you can be wise, worldly wise, in the ways of the world, how the world works. You can be a wise architect. You know all the principles and the causes of architectural principles. You can be a wise biologist. You know all the causes of how DNA works and how organisms work, right? Or, or Stacy is a wise chemist. She knows all the properties and causes of how things work chemically. Well, those are all just a subset of reality, all the different sciences, right? Biology, chemistry, physics. But then there's philosophy, literally the love of wisdom. And it looks at the knowledge of things from the point of view of the highest cause. Know by the light of natural reason alone. How can we think about not just a subset of reality, but the whole thing? <laughs> Why does the world exist? Why does the universe exist rather than nothing? And these are philosophical questions. And you can have a higher level of wisdom with this. Another thing in the universe, they're just more powerful. And sadly, even a lot of Christians have a view of God that way. That God is, is like us. He's, he's in the universe. He's a part of it, but just more powerful. But that's not God. Being another thing in the universe is not what I'll call God, and certainly not Thomas Aquinas. So let's think about how do Christians think about God? And how do we think with faith? Blaise Pascal said that there's two great dangerous extremes in the world. One is to shut reason out, right, to have only faith and no reason, and to let nothing else in. Right, to have only reason, no faith. Right? Both are extremes, and both are errors. Dawkins et al. are going to say that faith is failed reason. It doesn't live up to reason. Reason can tell you truth about the world, but faith comes and goes. It's opinion. But I'm going to say that almost everything that we know comes from faith. You get a three-year-old, what's that? What's that? What's that? And mom or dad or the teacher's going to say, well, that's, that's an oak tree. And the kid's going to believe it. Most of what we believe comes from, most of what we know comes from somebody telling us something and we believe that it's true. So what do we do when we get to relationships? You're dating someone who's like, is this, should I marry this person? I, I think she loves me, she tells me she does. She gives me gifts. She gives me a kiss every once in a while. But I want to be certain and so I'm going to have her take a lie detector test before I <laughs> If you're Sally, if I just ask you to do that, you should leave him. <laughs> right? You've just destroyed the relationship. I can learn a lot by Cy Kellogg, by what he says, by what he does, but I'm only going to really get to know him if he reveals himself to me. And I have to believe what he's telling me is true. Knowing who Cy Kellett is, or knowing who God is, who's even more personal than any of us. Why do we think that God's just the kind of thing that we can look up on the internet and Google something about God and know who God is? What kind of 
person God is. Science itself, as was the discussion last night, is based on faith. It can't operate without faith. What are the presuppositions that science has? Science is very powerful about knowing how the world works, but it's all based on this platform. We can have all of our laboratory stuff on top of this platform and explore the universe, but we can't explain where this platform comes from that allows us to do it, that, that it's a real world out there. And a Catholic worldview is going to say, no, God creates. God created the Big Bang and everything else that's going on. We can have the same with evolution. Where did humans come from? Did we come from God, as Scripture talks about? And just as a note, right, we were talking about, uh, Stacey was talking about, we, we should teach our children about evolution. And I would add to it, and we should be better in our artwork. Because if we're going to teach evolution, we should be more like the right-hand image from the cathedral in Gallup, New Mexico, that Adam and Eve are African, as opposed to the Caucasian Adam and Eve that most of us have grown up with. What that, might that do to our understanding of humans and relationships between races? Humans are created in the image and likeness of God. This is Jacob's ladder. And I think that fundamentally points to that we are creatures of God, and we can't understand who we are except in relationship to God. So it's either God created us, the new atheists are going to say, or it's evolution. And because evolution gives us a natural cause for where humans come from, and every other species on the planet, we no longer need God as a cause. Right? It's just eliminating it. But God has to be another cause in the world for that to be true. God can purify religion of error and superstition. And religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Most of them are written by, this is an oxymoron, devout atheists. Uh, people who are very committed to atheism. Uh, the book on the right, Free Will Explained, by Mr. Dan Barker, actually. Dan and I just had a debate on whether the Christian God exists. You can go on Catholic Answers to view it right now. Uh, it's a debate you won't want to miss. There are some moments that even I couldn't predict that ended up happening there. But Dan wrote this book saying Free Will is an Illusion. Sam Harris, if you were listening to Father Ehrman's talk, Sam Harris, one of the new atheists, has written a book on free will saying, look, we don't have free will. Uh, I mean, after all, there's no God and everything is an accidental material universe. If there was just a big bang and then it's matter in motion, how can we say anything is but the inevitable chain of physical causes and effects you see in the universe of free will? One that you could easily remember. All right, here's the argument. Premise one, if beings do not have free will, then they don't have moral responsibility. Premise two, human beings do have moral responsibility. Therefore, human beings do have free will. Uh, so this is a, a val logically valid argument. No one would contest the form of the argument. The only way you could refute this argument is to show either premise one or premise two are false. Uh, and how would you do that? Well, there's two different types of people in the free will debate who would try to argue, make a, a case against this argument. First would be the compatibilists. Compatibilists who say you can have free will, you cannot have free will and not have moral responsibility. <laughs> Sam Harris writes in his book Free Will, he says maybe if we just educated ourselves enough, we would look at violent criminals like rapists or murderers not as people to blame. And he says retributive justice. He and others like him say retributive justice, that barbaric idea you ought to be punished for your crimes. Uh, it's just a Stone Age relic. We should look at them more as like hurricanes or landslides. These of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our commonwealth, or our citizenship, is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. So I think what we should take from this is that we have to be courageous to graciously, yet assertively, present the truth of the human person made in the image and likeness of God, male and female, who is not merely a soul inhabiting a body, who is not just a brain, but is a composite of body and soul. And that in this life you may have a disorder, you may have a body that does not function properly. That is what sin gave us. But God gave us something greater than sin. He gave us a son who conquered sin. And whatever we have been afflicted with, whether we have a mental disorder, identity disorder, a physical injury, 
whether we grieve over those who have injuries among us, God will transform all of us in the twinkling of an eye so that our lowly bodies will be transformed like his glorious body. All right, so we just saw Trent Horn speak, <laughs> eating your second lunch, and we got our book signed, and now we're waiting for it. They're going to do a live stream show of Catholic Answers, like a taping here, and audience members can ask questions. We're doing a wave. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> okay, every time I go to these things, they're like, all right, everyone, start cheering, and I'm just not for this, like, crowd excitement thing. I'm like, can we just start the show? Discussions about faith and science, and a couple of the folks who are, have been uh, speakers uh, and continue to be our guests here at the conference are our guests for both hours today. If you have questions about faith and science, any questions of a faith and science nature, that's what we're going to be covering this hour. I had never had the courage as a scientist to ask the biggest question of all, the biggest why of all. Like, I could do, you know, here's why this happens, here's why this happens, talking in terms of reactions and molecules and even just around the house and cooking and stuff. But I never, it's like I always just worked my whole life with my eyes down and I was afraid to look up and out at that chasm of truth. Mm -hmm. I, could, I think because I was afraid of what it might demand of me. But when I finally let myself go there, I saw so much more. I saw my science in the context to which it belongs. It's God's handiwork. A greater appreciation of God as the creator. It's. It's this thing I do, like my, my brain goes, I've been doing it for so long that I forget what it's like not to do it. But I don't look at anything uh, without thinking about the underlying atomic structure. I mean, I, I'm well aware that we don't know most of the time um, exactly what the underlying atomic structure is of most things, including our own bodies, completely. But I'm always aware that it's happening. Like when we talk about quantum mechanics, it's, it's something real. It's going on right now in your bodies. It's what's holding you together. And I just sort of look at everything through those eyes. And like sometimes when I'm walking out among the trees and you know, it's clicking through my head because I know something about what's going on at the atomic level. And it, it gives me such a much greater appreciation for what I'm looking at than just saying those trees are pretty, like to know why they're so pretty. Um, not knowing science in that way, in my opinion, it's like getting to the end of your life and not seeing a rainbow. You, you can make it through life without knowing those things, but it adds such a beauty and a depth. And for, for me, as a woman of faith, it, it just makes me think all that much more about just how big God really is. Evolutionary theory, with all it knows about genetics and the fossil record and comparative anatomy and the, the geological distribution, it's only going to drive you so far down the road, okay? It's going to get you pretty far. And right now, evolutionary science, the scientists, for no religious reasons, they're just saying, it so turns out, you know, humans have populated the entire earth. It seems like there was a very small population from which humans arose. And sometimes um, now they're talking about there were two populations on opposite sides of Africa. Um, this is a question for Dr. Um Psychos and Father Terence. Um, I do my best to, to incorporate the church's teachings on evolution theory, specifically the evolutionary of, of humans. And it was hard for me um, to reconcile the faith with all those findings, especially with the anthropology textbooks and all the museums depict the evolution of. Uh, well, G.K. Chesterton and his um, Father Brown mysteries, it might even be the first one in the collection, talks about how Father Brown knew that this the bad guy imitating a priest couldn't be a priest because he attacked reason. And the church loves reason. And I think hopefully from the first two days of this conference, you've gotten that sense the church loves reason and it loves faith. That these two flow from the one source of truth, who is God. So this is my, my first thing is what, what can we know from reason, whether that's science or philosophy, what can tell us about the natural world? At the University of Notre Dame, in their science building that was built maybe 10 years ago, Jordan Hall of Science, on the floor are three medallions. One depicting biology, one chemistry, and one physics. And the biology one has a DNA molecule in the center, and around the edge of the medallion is the quote from Theodosius, Theodosius Dobchansky, who was a Orthodox, he was raised in the Orthodox Church, he was a Christian believer, but one of the main proponents and advocates for how Darwinian evolution was merged in the 1930s, what's called the modern synthesis, 
with embryology, with paleontology, with genetics, to give us help understand evolution today. And his, the title of his address that he gave to a bunch of teachers, high school teachers, was Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And evolution brings all aspects, embryology, genetics, uh, taxonomy, paleontology, all aspects of biology together. And it, it gives it a reason, it, it makes it coherent. And so we can look to the findings of what we know from all those fields, and it's all indicating that humans have a lineage that goes back in time, and that this is part of understanding our, our family history in a sense. Now I would say that we're not descended from apes, right? this was a common misconception back in the days of Darwin and uh, the debates that people were having in the 19th century, that we're not descended from apes. People make those jokes, well maybe on my mother's side but not my father's side. <laughs> but apes and humans share a common ancestor. And so we think the human lineage split off from the chimpanzee lineage about five to seven million years ago. But we were never descended, we've never been descended from apes. But that there are abundant fossil records. You go back to the Australopithecines, then you get into Homo habilis and Homo erectus and, and Homo nalendi and Homo ergaster and all these different homos. And all this is based on just fossils that we found, perhaps a skull or a thigh bone or teeth or something. And so I think that it points wonderfully to this humility. If you think about the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and Adam being created out of the dust of the earth, right? There's a humility that, and all the other animals are created out of the dust of the earth. Right? So we share a consanguinity with all of creation. Better than not teaching them that. I mean, if, if scientists find fossils, they're not going to throw them down and walk away and pretend like they didn't see them because it's a hard question. You're teaching your students to face the hard questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know as much as you can and you don't know everything, but you know something more than you did yesterday. And here's my, my theory that I'm going to posit to you. Many American Catholics are not formed in the Catholic faith fully. They are very influenced by the Protestant culture around them, which is fundamentalist and literalist sometimes. What, what would you make of that? That also, to, and that gets into the media, and so the media loves a good conflict. And so, no. And so they, they, he did it, right? He's in the media, he's in the media. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just saying in the media. And so, and so Right? They love the conflict and they just promote this simplistic view that they can sell newspapers or blog clicks or whatever. And so it's, I think that's, that's part of it, right? It's, and I just remember the second point that I wanted to make to that. Like, oh. <laughs> it eventually comes as I get older. I mean, Do you edit in your book, Stacey? <laughs> it took a long time. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, on page seven. So St. Augustine didn't take the seven days of Genesis 1 literally, right? He thought these were all parts of the end. Um, so he didn't take those literally, and he said, he has an interpretation of Genesis, he has a big book on it, and he says, even pagans know something about the natural world. And it's shameful for Christians, right, for Catholics, to be saying something about how the natural world works based on what scripture is saying about it, when everybody else in the world knows that it's not true. Yeah. Not only will we be laughed at for the people saying it, but the authors of scripture will be laughed at. And if they can't take Catholic serious about aspects of science, how are they ever going to take it seriously about the resurrection and the incarnation? My question is, I heard you don't even have to be Catholic to take the Eucharist uh, as long as you believe that it's the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, I'm not arguing that part. But so how, how do you... How do you believe that a piece of bread can turn into a piece of flesh after you consume it or what happened? This is a big deal for me because I would literally, I tried not to, and I was trying to be reverent, but I would literally kneel at Mass and I would just stare and I'd be like, when's it happening? When's it happening? When's it happening? What are the electrons going to do? Like, what are they going to do? What's going to happen? What's going on in all the molecules there? And, and so I looked it up and nothing changes in the molecules. That's the beauty. It's a special miracle. There's no other change like it anywhere in creation. It literally, we, we literally do stare at something and it's, 
it physically doesn't change. There's no accidental change. There's no, there's no change of the molecules rearranging, doing anything different. The substance changes. It becomes the body and blood of Christ. The substance of faith is things unseen. And you can't get much more unseen than something changing, and even an elemental analysis wouldn't show it. So it is the most unseen change. It is, it's a radical act of faith. And when I was converting, too, I, you know, there was just a moment. I read something uh, from St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. And she had sort of a moment, too. She was standing there at a mass and looking at all the people kneeling. And one of the, the other people in the town came by. I think it was a procession. And, and he said, can you believe all these Catholics kneeling? They think that's the body and blood of Christ. And she said it just hit her. Her soul said yes. And she said, I believe it, too. And that's, that's kind of how it happened for me, too. It was like, I believe it. I do want to uh, clarify one thing, and uh, thanks for staying with us, Ryan, but we don't believe that a piece of bread becomes a piece of flesh. I would, that would be fair to say. Right. It, it becomes the, it's the, it's the presence of the risen Lord under body, soul, divinity, right? We are at the Mixer event. Yay! But we're not mixing. Being very social and talking to all these new people. So as you can see, So we came out to end our day two of the conference at this beautiful park. So after that mixer we kind of left and then we got our selfie with Sai finally. <laughs> highlight and then we came out to this beautiful place and just in time for sunset and there's like hang gliding and it's really nice. Beautiful view. Our generation. In my cherry tree, they're gonna you look grass as green and gold like you do the sunset. Dreaming of you look sky. Never I am alone with you. You make me feel like I am fine. Never far.